Welcome to the Lorecast, where we look into the lore and the stories by which we live. I'm Dr. Craig Chalkwist, and you can find us at chalkwist.com slash podcast and at a number of other online venues. I need to give you an update on Enchant Vale, which is my online community for deep dreamers, inspired thinkers and doers, people of the heart, enchantivists. In other words, people who make a difference through storytelling and performance in the arts. And to lead up to that, I want to mention a couple of things in connection with my dissertation. Because when I defended it, there was a piece I wanted to read that I didn't get to. And before I do that, I wanted to just read you the abstract because it's relevant to Enchant Vale. My dissertation is called Restorying Our Lore. Fiction, Vision, and Imagination as an Earth-Honoring Wisdom Path. This is the abstract. Belief in absolute truths is overrated. This study argues that inspiring tales, imaginatively woven, can serve as a playful and creative frame of orientation, inspiration, and action. A life path of meaning and magic not to believe, but to believe in. Laurologizing refers to how we can use compelling fiction, broadly defined, as lore for weaving stories, personal or collective, around an ideal vision or dream, without recourse to massive, systematizing, creedal absolutism or hardened dogma. We can also update old storied elements, even myths and folktales, by laurologizing them to bring out their relevance for how we live and work and for what we aspire to in the quest for a more just and humane world. Drawing on Hermeticism, Gnosticism, and the long tradition of imagination as Gnosis, World Read, a depth philosophy offering an earth-honoring path of re-enchantment in a time of global disruption and climate chaos, provides an example of laurologizing. World Read can be used as an eco-spiritual path as well. Its depth philosophy informs the assembling Terrania cycle, hopeful science fiction tales charting the long adventure by which human beings come of age as a species. All very well, but how do we actually do it? Well, one thing we need to do is have a community of kindred, of fellow visionaries who can discuss all this and put projects together and come up with ideas about what to do next. And so um, the other piece I wanted to read you from my dissertation is going to inflict on you a really bad imitation of Mark Twain. And the reason I'm doing this is a while back I was watching an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, and it was it's called Time's Arrow. Um, this happens in the second part of it. And it's a time travel episode during which Samuel Clemens ends up on the Enterprise, more or less by accident. So since he's there, the ship's counselor, Deanna Troy, gives him a tour of the ship. And so I wanted to read you a little bit of their conversation because I remember my reaction when I heard it. Uh, I felt challenged, inspired, um, wanting to build something better than we have today in terms of social arrangements. Anyway, you'll have your own reaction. And um, you should probably just watch the scene instead of my bad imitation of it. And this is just a little part of it. So they're walking through the corridors of the ship. And they're passing members of the crew, including one non-human being with blue skin. And at one point, Deanna asks Twain, Clemens, what do you think of all this? And Clemens says, any place that doesn't stock a good cigar doesn't rank high in my book. Well, I know what you say. This is a vessel of exploration. And your mission is to discover new worlds. But that's what the Spanish said and the Dutch and the Portuguese. It's what all conquerors say. I'm sure that's what you told that blue-skinned fellow I just saw before you brought him here to serve you. 
Indiana says, the people you see here are here by choice. So there are a privileged few who serve on this sh these ships in luxury and wanting for nothing. But what about everybody else? What about the poor? You ignore them. Poverty was eliminated on Earth a long time ago. And a lot of other things disappeared with it. Hopelessness, despair, cruelty. I come from a time when men achieved power and wealth by standing on the backs of the poor, where prejudice and intolerance are commonplace and power is an end unto itself. And you're telling me that isn't how it is anymore? That's right. Uh, well, maybe it's worth giving up cigars for after all. It has long seemed to me, and I've mentioned this a few times in these podcasts, that we can't get to where we need to be, either as individuals as, or as a species, unless we can imagine where we should be. And we have to do that together. We have to imagine together. That's where it starts. And as much as we tend to dismiss imagination, it's actually behind everything worthwhile that involves being human. Our greatest projects, our loves, our empathies, our creativity, anything innovative, it's all about imagination. Scientific thought experiments and theories, they're constructs of the imagination. And yet we don't use it. So here in the States, our political parties, the only thing they use imagination for is getting back at each other. And they are utterly without vision. There's nothing exciting about what they offer. One party is about revenge, hatred, division, exclusion, and the other party is about, we're saving you money. So it seems to me that the first step, and it's a very modest one, there's only so much one person can do by way of organizing things, is to bring people together and offer some stories, which in my case has to do with myths and folktales and fairy tales I'm familiar with, as well as my own fiction, as well as the list that I've kept over the years of more than 100 examples of how fiction, storytelling, performance, and art change reality, which to me sounds pretty practical. So... This group is for the people who haven't given up or are trying not to. And it's certainly easy to do. The cynical position is the easy position. You just read the news and say, well, we're all screwed. You know, between political instability, constant warfare, genocide, climate change. Um, but if you're not willing to take the easy road and just give up, you might like our group, Enchant Vale. The word veil has a long history behind it, um, long and colorful and meaningful and mythic. And in my fiction, there's actually a realm called the dream veil, which is basically the realm of imagination, as all creatives have known it. Young talked about it at length, um, talked about its reality. It has its own reality. Um, he was aware of hermetic tradition that says something similar, Islamic Gnosticism, something similar, lots of traditions. So the dream veil in my fiction is a place where anything fictional that happens is basically recorded and ongoing and it has its own life. And so any realm you can think of, fantasize about more accurately, is there. And they're separated each other from each other by veils. So there's Veil Middle Earth and Veil 24th Century Star Trek and Veil... Two cities, as um, Dickens knew them, and uh, any anything fictional at all, even a poem, even a fantasy, there it's alive somewhere in the dream veil. And so, in my fiction, one of the ways we move forward is by getting to know the dream veil and its and its characters, and learning that when we create something, they're as involved in it as we are, and in some cases, perhaps more. So, Enchant Veil is. Um, and a couple of things. It's an online community where visionaries gather. It's an alternative social media platform. So you can post in there, chat in there, look up people near you if that functionality is enabled. You can turn it off also. 
um, put up pictures, put up videos, n do some networking. There's actually a discussion circle specifically for networking. There's one called the Commons where people can just hang out. And there's different tiers of participation with the first one being free. So if you sign up and create a profile, you get access to some of the discussion circles and some good news. And not just the good news of, oh, somebody helps somebody, which of course is important, but inspiring news. The kind of news that you read and think, you know, maybe everything isn't going down the drain. So that's in there too. The higher level tiers are paid tiers and um, they get you free classes that I've packaged up or are, am streaming. Um, and speaking of classes, it's seemed to me for some time that I really need my own platform. And I really like teaching, of course. I, I, was, I think I was made to do it. I, I'd be unhappy if I didn't get to teach, but I don't have to do it all in academia and I never have. So I show up in lecture, I'm in podcasts and interviews, um, all kinds of different formats. And uh, I also teach for Young Platform, which I enjoy. I'm going to keep doing it. But I thought, you know, it'd be nice to have my own platform. So I could do webinars. I could um, I could do something like a book club where we take some, some difficult work like Young's The Archetypes of the Collective Unconscious and we go through it and we meet every so often and discuss it. And maybe we'll meet seven or eight times or longer or shorter. And other topics too, ar personal archetype and myth. Or terror psychology, get to know the presence of the places where you live. All kinds of possibilities. Starting at level, at tier level two, there's a dream group that you can have access to. So there's you can do dream work in there. And as this builds, uh, I want to hire instructors, I've already talked to a few of them, to come in and teach specialized topics, um, embodied mindfulness, and um, maybe a bit of philosophy that's actually lived and then fleshed, not just abstract, and some of the deep stuff. And of course, dreams and dream work. So I've got it all ready to go, and I've had a couple of people come in, look around, and give me constructive feedback about what could be improved, which I've implemented. And so now I'm in the liminal period of waiting and <clears throat> seeing what my dreams have to say as I sit with this, what my feelings are saying. And um, so far what they've been saying is not quite yet, but almost. <laughs> I was in a retreat with uh, Victoria Lors and her Seminary of the Wild Earth, which I'm a part of. And um, Corinne London led us in an imaginal exercise that was really powerful for me. And it had to do with different um, animals showing up, um, higher self, which the Gnostics would have called my angel showing up, and everybody looking east as the the first rim of sunlight came up, the dawn broke. And then after that, the sun would rise. And so I took that to mean just about there. Just about there. So by the time you hear this, it could be launched, um, or it soon will be. But I've put a huge amount of work into it, and it's a labor of love. I've really enjoyed putting it together. I want it to be not only useful, but inspiring. I want people to show up and think, this is great. This is helping me live, helping me work, helping me meet other interesting people. And it's validating my visionary side. There's a lot of us who never got that validated or just sporadically. And uh, when I read Hermann Hesse's novel, Steppenwolf, there was a term that stuck with me, and it, it appears in different forms in different novels of Hesse. So the character Hermina is talking to the protagonist, Harry Holler, and she says, what makes you and me different is that we have one dimension too many. And we're not good with just sitting around playing cards and listening to the radio while the world shoots itself to pieces. 
there's something in us that wants more. The meaning, the magic, and other things. And in uh, his earlier novel, Damien, the term is people of the mark. Um, people who are marked invisibly to be a little different. Creative people. And at one point, the character Damien says, what makes us different is that we have a different mode of vision. No other difference. All of us part of the human family, but we see differently. So it seems to me that those of us who feel that way might benefit from a combination community hub, sanctuary, safe place to be, opportunity to network and create, alternative social media, and that's what I put together. And it will undoubtedly evolve as time goes on. As I fantasize ahead, I'm imagining meeting in person and having conferences and doing other creative things together. So maybe some film in there somewhere or parties or celebrations or for those of us who like to dance, maybe some dances. That would be good. Our projects we can do together. All kinds of possibilities. In my fiction, there's a historical point at which about, I don't know, 150 years from now, I forget exactly, but all the creatives in the world have finally had enough, and they all stand up. The artists, the filmmakers, the musicians, the street performers. Everybody you can think of as creative, the dancers, the writers, they all stand up together. They all network together, and they say, we want a different, more inclusive, more joyful, just, equitable, and fun world to live in. And they build it. Guiding their efforts is a new kind of organization called the Dreamvale Exchange. Most of our creativity is left in the unconscious. It functions sporadically, um, sometimes half-heartedly, sometimes it possesses us fully. But in the case of the Dream Veil Exchange, we can actually go individually or in groups and talk to whichever imaginal figures we desire and co-create new things. And so that's a resource that's available to the creatives who build a new world. Because who else is going to do it? Do you think really that politicians are going to? And there are good politicians and bad ones. Genuine idealists with integrity and the other kind. And they, they have their part to play. So do theologians and priests and clergy. So do financiers. Powerful people all over the world, influential people, stars of different kinds, celebrities. They all have a part to play if they choose to play it constructively. But do you really think those people are going to usher in a new world? I don't. I think it's up to us. If we don't do it, it won't get done. And we've reached a point historically where we have to do it. We have to have something more just, more creative, more inclusive, or we'll go under as a species. We're already destroying our own home world, or at least the surface of it. So it's time to grow up. It's really time to come of age, to mature emotionally and socially and spiritually and get our act together. The uh, trickster of my series is an archetypal cosmic power named Clooney who has a lot to say about this. And at one point he tells a human being, you know, you people really have to get your act together because right now you're the galaxy's poster child for how to screw up a world. Do you really want that to be your legacy? Well, I don't. We can do better. But to do better, we have to dream better. And to dream better, we need places where we can safely dream and come up with things that don't just push us from behind like a bunch of shoulds and oughts, but pull us forward toward the futures of our desire. So welcome to Enchant Vale. Look it over and see if it appeals to you as a good place to go. Thank you.